Hello and welcome back to uh, this lecture 21 of uh, Biomems. I uh, will do a quick preview of uh, what was done in the last class. So, we talked about uh, the self assembly of nanoparticles and structures using DNA molecules, wherein uh, basically uh, the complementarity of one strand with another was used as a property to assemble one or more nanoparticles. Um, the strategy could be used for making interconnects at the nano level, wires, uh, etcetera. So, uh, we also talked about DNA hybridization um, as a strategy to detection and uh, discuss microarrays. Essentially, they are libraries of uh, different capture probes which can be used to hybridize uh, the, the DNA specimen, the target uh, DNA molecule. And then uh, you can actually uh, label uh, the target with the fluorophore, so that as it goes on to the capture probe and gets immobilized onto the surface, you could do a fluorescence readout and see whether there is a binding kinetics which is happening between the capture probe and the target DNA. So, we talked about a little bit of concepts about microarrays, features, um, what exactly hybridization is or how it can be done or how sensing can be done. And then we also discussed about the various utility aspects of such microarrays, um, essentially RNA transcription profiling or uh, HIV resequencing, all uh, these different things can be studied using DNA microarrays. Okay. We also talked about two different companies and two different approaches that uh, exist in the market as on date for these uh, different uh, micro DNA microarrays. Uh, the two companies are Affymetrix and Nanogen. One of them actually the Affymetrix is uh, one which does a light directed synthesis of uh, these captured probes. So, essentially by using um, several uh, photo masking strategies and chemical steps in between, so there is a build up of molecule by molecule. So, you can have uh, uh, several combinations of these different ATCGs in order to realize a variety of capture probes in different points of space okay, over the whole uh, array. And so, therefore, you could actually open and close pixels by doing multiple steps, so that you could build exactly the molecule that you are looking at and have an information of the sequence on the capture probe. Nanogen on the other hand is um, a company which actually gives you the chips and lets you assemble the capture probes that you want. Okay. So, you have to buy the capture probes separately and this is also known as the electronic uh, way of uh, immobilizing capture probes. Essentially, there are a bunch of electrode arrays on a surface and uh, you are using a positive potential to pull selectively on some few uh, posts, gold posts, these molecules, these negatively charged uh, DNA molecules, which would thereby go and uh, bind on the surface. There is a binding film like poly and lysine, which is essentially positive charge and uh, there is electrostatic attraction between the negatively charged DNA and the surface. So, you have a build up uh, different over these different electrodes, uh, all different kind of arrays. And you could actually use a negative potential on the others, so that you could direct only to uh, the particular position in which you want the capture probe. And so, it has a very specific uh, process for doing this immobilization of capture probe. So, we talked about these different approaches and then also discussed about uh, the DNHF from Motorola, which uses electrochemical sensing using a FECN label. Um, and a bunch of different molecular linkers and wires as standing up on a surface upright as a brush polymer and uh, uh, using of signaling and a capture probe in order to capture uh, a certain target and uh, position the FECN uh, 6 or the you know the ferrocyanide probe very very close to one of those molecular wires to take up the current and then read out uh, what is there as sequence on uh, the target DNA. Okay. So, but today we will actually start with a new uh, area, area which is also known as uh, the fundamental process for gene sequencing. It was developed way back in 1975 by a uh, scientist named William Sanger and this process has been popularly known in his name as Sanger's reaction. So, uh, this is uh, again a very interesting and fundamental level technique for identifying the sequence on the genes. And by sequence what I mean is suppose there is a DNA molecule as shown here and reading out from the 5 prime to 3 prime you can have these different groups A, A, T, C, T, G you know this again G, C. And so, there is a sequence of these molecules. 
So, essentially the sequence is a very important piece of information because uh, it gives an address of uh, the particular biological moiety or entity which contains this. Okay. It may be unique to a certain bacterial cell or a certain virus and it may be able to identify if the virus is there uh, in, in the ambient uh, just by looking at the sequence of the DNA uh, that it has. So, it is a very important information which is now after uh, the human pro genome project uh, being recorded in a, in a large database which is maintained at a global level and uh, research gets on added where the sequences are identified for any new stain or any new bacteria or any new virus and it is essentially put up there. Uh, it is also known as the NIH database. Okay. Now, how do we identify the sequence? Uh, this very famous uh, Sanger's reaction is all based around this, uh, this molecule which is a dideoxy nucleotide. Okay. So, you can see uh, the schematic of the molecule here. It is a dideoxy nucleotide. So, therefore, there would be a dideoxy uh, chain terminated A adenine, uh, dideoxy chain terminated cytosine, guanine and thymine respectively. So, there are 4 different dideoxy chain terminated molecules. Okay. Now, uh, the way that this goes is that there are uh, the several different constituents in the Sanger's reaction. There is uh, an enzyme this DNA polymerase which essentially synthesizes um, uh, you know the broken strands of the DNA. Uh, there are uh, different uh, 4 different DNTPs which is the normal um, A, T, C and G. It is not the dideoxy chain terminated uh, NTP and then uh, we have 4 different reactions. So, this process is carried out in 4 different steps. Okay. In each of these steps there is a different dideoxy ATP, dideoxy uh, CTP, dideoxy GTP and dideoxy ATP essentially. Okay. So, uh, let me just write all this down here for your convenience. So, you have a reaction 1 with DDATP, number 2 with DDCTP. 3 with DD GTP and 4 with DD thymine a nucleotide. Okay. The dideoxy chain essentially uh, is uh, an end group which stops the reaction. So, whenever you have the addition of a dideoxy chain, um, it uh, does not let the DNA chain replicate anymore. It essentially stops uh, the replication process. So, the chain is broken at that instance. So, suppose if I have a reaction wherein in one go the chain is broken along A essentially. So, I can actually have a DNA molecule now from the 3 prime end all the way to about A. Okay. If uh, the reaction goes all the way up to let us say this particular G here. So, I can now have the in another, another uh, reaction. Uh, the chain terminated from G. So, therefore, 3 prime to G uh, will be there on the chain. So, uh, whenever you put these uh, different dideoxy chain terminated agents which is also about 1 percent by volume of uh, the NTPs into the reaction and then independently uh, do the 4 reactions. So, wherever there is a, a thymine and uh, this gets bonded to a DDATP it automatically cleaves the reaction. So, there can be a fragment wherever there is a thermine there is a fragment of that particular length. Okay. So, if you put uh, if you if you try to put this uh, DDGTP on the reaction. So, wherever there is a cytosine uh, on the principal DNA strand uh, the, uh, the DNA will break and so there will be multiple lengths of DNA available as the end product of all these solutions okay, or all these reactions. But mind you uh, these are terminated only at a single group like for example, if it is a DDGTP then it will terminate only uh, at the cytosine groups in the DNA. If it is a DDTTP then it will terminate only onto the adenine groups on the principal DNA. So, once these products are run through the gel uh, they have all varied lengths and uh, you can easily fractionate them using gel electrophoresis. So, uh, the smaller the DNA is the faster it moves the longer it is the slower it moves and essentially you will have a readout like this. So, this is the DDATP. So, essentially the chain termination here takes place along the thymine group. So, wherever there is a thymine on the DNA molecules you have fragments made up of that level. So, essentially 
uh, these uh, thymine terminated processes are represented as gels let us say here, here, here and here right. So, it gives an idea of the position or the length at which this particular uh, group is present. So, wherever there is a DTTP dideoxy TTP it terminates uh, the molecule wherever there is an adenine and so therefore, if you run the products you have these different lengths of products which are coming out where there was actually an adenine on the parent DNA group. Similarly, in the DDCTP you will have products uh, which are kind of fractionated in a manner corresponding to wherever there is a G or a guanine and similarly DDGTP the products terminated in a manner wherever there is a cytosine in, in this particular group. So, you have these different instances okay, where you can find out that uh, how or where exactly what group is located. So, if you read this out as a whole if you read this whole uh, gel image and then try to see whatever comes and corresponding to that what it is really. So, the, if there is a TTP in the reaction there really should be an A here okay? and A here uh, there should be a T here uh, similarly there is a T here. So, essentially this kind of gives you um, a, a feel of uh, what exactly uh, it is that you are looking at okay? and of the DNA. And if you just uh, put this sequence all together something like this you get the total sequence on the DNA. So, uh, this is essentially the process right uh, in, in a nutshell if you would like to summarize what happens. So, dideoxynucleotide is a kind of stopping mechanism for the extension any further extension of the DNA strand uh, leading to the cutting the cutting the replication reaction at a certain point where the dideoxy group is picked up. So, if there are certain points which are corresponding to uh, the complementary pair as that on the dideoxy end group it is picked up and the reaction stops there. Similarly, the DNTPs with 1 percent DDNTPs uh, are normally used for this process and every time the product is run through a sieving gel you have all different sizes which comes up on the gel from which you can read out really what is the sequence of the DNA and uh, essentially the readout process is also electrophoresis best in this case. Now, uh, when we are talking about electrophoresis uh, I would like to just uh, kind of reiterate again that uh, there are different types of sieving matrices based on which you could have almost close to a one base pair resolution. For example, the different products like let us say uh, pluronic it is a trico block polymer uh, polyethylene oxide polypropylene oxide polyethylene oxide this has essentially very small pores you know and it is an absolutely transparent gel material within capillaries of felt it results in a reusable or a washable capillary essentially because this material goes into liquid or gel depending on the ambient temperature. Um, there is an agarose material which is most commonly used in laboratories for this work of electrophoresis. Uh, there are polyacrylamide gels, uh, there are pr products associated with hydroxyalkyl cellulose and uh, a lot of different polymers of the kind uh, which would have essentially a porous uh, content and would also have some kind of uh, storage for the buffer uh, to be there in the channels etcetera. So, uh, these uh, matrices are very often used to get these kind of readouts as I illustrated here just about a minute back and from that you could actually read what is there on this particular DNA. Okay. Now, there seems to be a little problem though and uh, the problem is the speed the rapidity which you can read this out. And so, therefore, uh, there have been initiatives or efforts in this bio MEMS or diagnostics area where uh, people have really tried to evaluate that can all this mechanism of this reaction and gel uh, and readout so on so forth be made you know made sensitive enough or rapid enough so that you could go to a very low time of detection level. Okay. So, for that uh, there is a group in uh, uh, you know University of California Turbine. Uh, who are working on these uh, strategies based on uh, the atomic force microscope. Essentially uh, the idea is to be able to pick up molecules on a very small minuscule level and uh, use uh, surface electrophoresis to shift the molecules back and forth uh, in this particular manner uh, by applying a potential. And then once uh, these are all picked up using a hybridization array or something where there is a primary level detection you could sequence it by running it on the small wells here uh, and running the Sanger's reaction picking up the products 
and then the idea is that there is a label is kind of inserted into uh, the particular uh, sequenced product. Uh, you can see the fluorescence once it is moved down uh, with a pulsating electric field. Uh, so, so uh, as it crosses this self luminous step here uh, it kind of gives out a fluorescence response from which you can back calculate what was there on the uh, on the end uh, you know on the on the group on the DNA essentially. So, you are at a stage picking uh, up the correct DNA by using hybridization and then picking it up using an AFM pro using a small voltage at the tip of the probe and then essentially uh, you are trying to drop this back down uh, into small small numbers into different wells which would do these four reaction steps associated with Sanger's and uh, then the products when they are all different lengths and they are uh, kind of uh, labeled with a certain uh, fluorophore which is also corresponding to the end group which is there uh, uh, on the dideoxy chain okay, or, or which is terminated at the di by the dideoxy chain. Uh, that particular molecule uh, would come out at a certain rate okay, where uh, 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 it will come out at a certain point of time from the AFM tip. The way you read the fluorescence again you create a small self luminous spot here and then using an AC signal you can actually send this down this DNA down uh, you have picked up the DNA here uh, in this case from this particular well if you can see right. And so, you have to send these different lengths down along the tip of an AFM so that it kind of uh, goes one by one and as it crosses the luminous point you get a certain fluorescence readout uh, from which you can find out what was the base pair which was chain terminated okay, or which had the dideoxy end group and from that you could also find out what is the sequence in the DNA that you are picking up. So, this is essentially uh, a very interesting technique that people have been de developing. Uh, I would also uh, like to illustrate a little bit about what surface electrophoresis would be actually able to do uh, in this particular case as you are seeing. Uh, the first question which comes to mind is that why is it that people would do electrophoresis on a surface when there are already existing uh, gels and other materials which would do this electrophoresis uh, beautifully. One of the reasons why um, electrophoresis is taken from a gel or a volume into a surface is essentially uh, because if you go above a certain base pair let us say about 10 kilo base pairs or so the gel materials irrespective of how big the pores are the has a tendency of uh, cutting down the resolution of DNA. So, b uh, beyond a certain point let us say if you are actually going above 10 kilo base pairs and trying to translate or fractionate DNA across this gel material there is a model called biased repetition which comes into picture which means that you know uh, let us suppose the DNA is like a serpent which is kind of unfolded if you may remember uh, we discussed this at length when we were talking about electrophoresis. So, the head of the serpent goes into a series of uh, pores, but then the DNA realizes it is too long to go through those bunch of pores into the next section okay. as a result of which uh, it decides to kind of stay back there and gets jumbled. So, it does not move forward anymore. So, this is a effect because of excessive friction between the walls of the capillary or walls of the of the pore through which the DNA is passing. To avoid this problem people or scientists have investigated uh, this process uh, using an alternative strategy called surface electrophoresis. Okay. So, this approach essentially uses electrostatic interactions between the molecules and the charged surfaces for size fractionation. I will just about explain this diagrammatically in a little bit and this technique uh, of DNA fractionation gives an alternative to all uh, these techniques in con context of separation of higher base pair sizes. So, it is a very good alternative that uh, the surfaces have, have to provide. Okay. So, how uh, the surface electrophoresis is done, is done and this is essentially out of uh, research work done at Benjamin Chu's group uh, up at Stony Brook. Uh, so, essentially uh, if you look at that when a DNA molecule is adsorbed on a flat surface there is really a loss of entropy due to which uh, due to the restrainment of DNA molecules on the surface. Okay. So, there is also an increase in energy due to uh, adsorption phenomenon uh, and uh, there is a balance of these two energies which promulgates the DNA segments to be present either as loops or trains. Okay. So, you are having a flat surface and you are putting this uh, or physisorbing this DNA on the surface and uh, you essentially have a layer of water over the surface and the DNA is still adsorbed physically adsorbed on the surface uh, over which the water is present. 
So, the DNA has a tendency to kind of balance uh, uh, the adsorption energy over uh, the local increase in entropy because of the extreme amount of negatively charged backbone and there is a configuration which comes out of it which is essentially like a loops and trains. So, the portions of the DNA are looping into the solution as if they are kind of hanging out and the portions uh, of DNA are essentially adsorbed uh, onto the surface of the solution. Okay. So, people have shown with molecular dynamics very interesting images and results which can call for it. Let us suppose if you look at this particular figure here, you can see how using a ball and string model uh, this uh, person here has been able to show uh, that you know there is there is really a tendency of this DNA to kind of get folded into a loop as well as these strains. Okay. So, there are these strains here and there are these loops uh, which, which essentially formulate. Now, uh, one interesting factor here is that uh, longer the DNA molecule is uh, the more would be the train part or more would be the adsorb part and one of the reasons why that is so uh, is because uh, you know the loops essentially are a bunch of different negative charges. So, if the molecule is very long you could consider that uh, the, the charges are too much to be uh, in the solution. So, there is a dense network of charge like this on the surface right. And so, if this DNA is long enough there is a huge repulsion if the if it were to be present as loops. So, it is definitely not a favorable energy configuration. So, the other configuration that would be available would happen when they are really adsorbed very close to the surface and they are small. So, the loops are basically small and the train part or the adsorption part is more. So, we get one fact from all this that the DNA molecule uh, if it is a longer molecule or it is a long molecule. Uh, there is a tendency of the train part to be more as opposed to the loop part uh, which closes or closely adheres it or adsorbs it on the surface. In this condition if you try, try to apply an electric field and try to move it along the direction of the electric field there is a tendency of the DNA uh, to move slower uh, by virtue of the adsorption energy which comes into play every time you have to go to the next step or the DNA has to go to the next step. Uh, as opposed to the shorter DNA segment where probably because uh, of uh, less interaction or less entropy uh, and longer loops and less adsorbed area uh, the DNA moves faster. So, this is actually a basis of size based fractionation of DNA, but just using surface without using bulk properties. And therefore, all those other impacts which would have otherwise uh, come from a three dimensional gel kind of matrix where there are a bunch of different pores through which this DNA is moving and there is a lot of friction between the DNA molecule and the pores. Uh, you almost always get um, a bundling and you know a loss of resolution at higher base pairs. However, in the surface case uh, the surface and the environment around it automatically adjust the DNA to have smaller loops or longer loops and essentially it just makes it move slower or faster and uh, there is a huge amount of resolution aspect in this particular case. So, I would like to illustrate some of the, the work that has been already done. So, this is the case of uh, shorter molecules. Okay. So, this essentially is the case of shorter molecules whereas, these are the longer ones. So, you have more uh, trains than loops. So, in summarily, uh, so whenever there is a DNA molecule adsorbed on flat surface there is a loss of entropy due to restrainment of DNA molecule. On the surface there is also an increase in energy due to adsorption. And the balance of these two energies promulgates the DNA segment to be present as loops or trains. Okay. Yeah, if uh, the surface is immersed in solution where then the loops extend into the solution and the trains which are contigu contiguous segments adsorbed over the surface are held close to the surface. The shorter the DNA molecules uh, are uh, they have less negative charge on them and so the repulsion force is not much and therefore, they form more number of loops extending into the solution than longer DNA molecules which behave otherwise due to high coulombic repulsion. Okay. They adsorb more on the surface rather than going into as loops. So, therefore, the smaller ones should move faster because they are less adsorbed on the surface. The only difference in this case is when that uh, only higher size fragments electrophoresis better in this case. Typically, it is 2 kpp onwards, but essentially the effect can be felt more from 10 kpp because uh, just like agarose could easily go up to uh, 10 kbp of course, there would be a resolution loss, uh, but then still you could make it detectable up to about 10 kbp. So, the utility of this process is felt beyond that although uh, they can actually start uh, starting from about 2 kilo base pair size of the DNA molecule. So, this is an excerpt uh, 
essentially taken from Benjamin Chu's group where they are talking about using this technique to detect uh, the relative uh, migration time of different sizes. So, here you can see uh, you have uh, uh, DNA of uh, 2 kbp all the way to about 8 kbp 8 kilo base pairs and you can see that uh, uh, if you see the log of mobility it kind of increases uh, decreases as uh, you increase the number of sizes. Uh, the, this is a plot between log of mobility of the DNA versus the log of number of base pairs right. So, if the number goes up here as you see the mobility goes down which is in perfect agreement of what our theory is really. Um, you have illustrated this uh, from this particular plot here of uh, the migration time versus fluorescence ok. So, one more uh, interesting factor which uh, Chu's group has shown is that you know you can really detect with an AFM the DNA adsorbed on an OTS covered silicon layer after an electric field of 4.5 volts per centimeter is applied ok. So, here uh, essentially these arrows uh, as you are seeing kind of indicate the shorter chains um, and the way they are moving. So, the shorter chains are all moving together if you see you know uh, these arrows kind of signify them these are the shorter chains. Uh, here essentially these are the shorter chains and um, the longer chains kind of move separately uh, which is probably not shown in this particular figure, but Benjamin Chu's group has observed this essentially. Okay, so, so essentially uh, a very repeatable kind of data uh, on a surface of DNA has been recorded and repeated. Now, the fluorescence uh, intensity spectra as a function of time for a 1 kilo base pair ladder on a bare SI surface is given in this particular uh, graph as we discussed before. Okay, so, we will I like to show you um, how some of the detection can be done and this is in fact a paper by Kuo et al uh, up at uh, the University of Tokyo and so what he talks about is that you have a microfabricated architecture here you are talking about an SU8 based micro channel with some reservoirs and this is uh, mounted in the top of two electrodes uh, which are made up of chromium ok and uh, essentially on a glass plate and uh, you connect these electrodes through an external battery an external source as indicated here and you basically um, run uh, the charged DNA from uh, the feed reservoir side which is this up to the detection reservoir side which is uh, this. So, here of course, uh, they have shown using UV light at 254 nanometers the labeled DNA the fluorescently lighted uh, DNA with the TBR ethidium bromide and this is of, of course, a lambda DNA uh, that kind of moves all through. So, you can see these these uh, figures of the reservoirs ok and they can see that with time this fluorescence spreads from this reservoir all the way up to the detection reservoir. Uh, what they also report is uh, an impedance based signal from connected from the electrode at the detection reservoir end where they see peaks coming as these DNA molecules would kind of go through uh, and, and pass or hit the particular electrode a positive electrode made up of this chromium ok. So, this kind of gives uh, or endorses this concept of surface electrophoresis. So, our group has done some work on X electrophoresis as well and this is uh, a most recent excerpt from um, the, uh, one of one of the works reported in uh, the American uh, Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, 2009 meeting. So, essentially this talks about a surface a silicon surface uh, with the, a potential across it wherein you are actually physisorbing some DNA molecules on one side of the surface. You have a PDMS upper layer which is acting as a cover and also gives a micro channel in between through which the DNA should be translated and you have actually pasted uh, electrodes film electrodes on both sides. Uh, so, that you can apply a strong field uh, from where the DNA is absorbed this side all the way to the other side here and then you have connected these through external wires ok and this whole assay is placed inside a very small flow cell as you are seeing here in this number 1 is the flow cell and you are filling this up or covering this whole thing up with the buffer solution. So, the DNA kind of loops into the solution and forms the same exact same configuration as was reported by uh, Chu's group ok. So, it is essentially brought under an inverted fluorescence microscope as you can see here which kind of uh, gives us a readout 
and uh, these uh, show some of the illustrations of uh, how a DNA ladder would behave on doing surface electrophoresis. So, this is a dye doped DNA uh, similarly this is after a few minutes of electrophoresis surface electrophoresis has occurred. So, you can see there is a marked difference between the way uh, that uh, the ladder looks uh, before electrophoresis as opposed to after electrophoresis this is simply physisorbed onto the, the silicon surface. I have uh, some other uh, data to share with you here is uh, again the translation of DNA molecules across the surface at different instances of time you could see all from 0 minutes all the way to about 23 minutes and you could see that because you have applied a positive and negative potential in the following manner uh, you are seeing that there is a translation of DNA towards the positive uh, uh, potential. You can actually do through image analysis a scan on the overall boundary and try to detect the centroid and then calculate mobility. Uh, this right here is an illustration where we are talking about the mobility of uh, such DNA molecules uh, and we find out that although the electric field is applied only parallel to the y axis there is almost always a Brownian motion along the x axis uh, which causes the DNA to move heather theater as uh, opposed to going just straight away in the direction of the electric field. Okay, so, the mobility of a 1 kilo base DNA on silicon dioxide surface with a voltage of 24 volts uh, has been plotted here in this graph and this is a corresponding to a separation distance of the electrode of around 1 centimeter or so. So, this is a, a perfect bidirectional process as you can see in this particular illustration what we did here is really we just go went ahead and change the direction of the electric field here this is negative and this is positive and you can see slowly that the DNA kind of emerges back into the field of view for this different time intervals as can be illustrated from 0 minutes all the way to about 10.03 minutes and then we kind of plot the mobility on the same me mechanism as we did before and still see the Brownian motion. Okay, so, this is a real problem because uh, you can get a one dimensional mobility model because of which we are trying other alternatives like kind of super focusing the DNA onto a very small track so that we can eliminate totally uh, the Brownian motion. The super focusing can be obtained by using um, a different surface energy pattern on a surface where we can really make a narrow hydrophilic pattern where all the DNA would rapidly converge and uh, we are not uh, sharing the data, data at this time, but uh, I just wanted to make an illustration of uh, what kind of research is possible in this particular area of surface electrophoresis. Okay. So, this is a mobility studies that we did uh, where we can show that you know on um, an energy on, on a higher energy surface like silicon dioxide as opposed to a lower energy surface like uh, porous uh, structure porous matrix made up of silica we have differential mobilities uh, which we report and uh, we are trying to understand the process better, but essentially uh, this is how surface electrophoresis can be done. So, I uh, now would like to illustrate um, another very novel um, technique of uh, biomems which biomems has to offer uh, based on uh, the various fabrication protocols or various kind of structures and features that can be fabricated using microsystems uh, uh, fabrication technology. Okay, so, this is really uh, the diagnostics at uh, micro nano scale and uh, is also the basic principle behind Coulter counters. So, uh, we are talking about um, some kind of a cell counter uh, by the name of Coulter counter. So, the whole goal here is the following. So, you have a pore a small pore uh, which is close to the size of a single cell okay. and this pore or this porous membrane is kept as the only communicating medium between two fluid cells where one side is rich in the cells and another side is essentially a lean mixture. And uh, if uh, assuming that the cells are uh, negatively charged and you apply a positive bias on the other side of the fence or the other side of the pore, uh, there would be a tendency of the cells to go and go into the pore and uh, go straight out uh, into the other side. Okay. And uh, while doing that it kind of momentarily blocks the pore and blocks the ion current which flows in the reverse direction as opposed to the direction of the movement of cells. So, this is simply based on this principle. Okay. Uh, so, you have a negatively charged cell here and uh, you have a pore a micro pore in silicon uh, which is made like this. Okay. This is the trans side or the trans chamber this is the cis side and you are applying a potential 
across uh, this particular porous membrane in a manner that uh, this negative cell is dragged into uh, the trans chamber side. Okay. So, the idea is that you keep on monitoring the ion current that means the current I with respect to the time t across this membrane and uh, the moment the cell goes and blocks the membrane there is a dip in the ion current and when it goes to the other side as you are seeing here uh, the current kind of takes up back. So, if I can count these dips with time I can be able to ascertain how many cells pass per uh, time from this uh, particular micro pore and this could be a basis of counting the number of cells that are there in the rich side of the solution. Okay. So, this is the basic principle of micro nanoscale coulter counters. Um, based on that based on this micro scale coulter counter you can extend the same concept onto the nano scale. In fact, uh, uh, the first uh, one of the first few um, articles which came out in this area was really uh, from uh, Kasyanovitz Krupp and uh, would like to illustrate one of that uh, example here where they talk about self assembly of uh, a protein by the name of alpha hemolysine. Uh, on the top of a lipid bilayer of a cell. So, if you see here this is essentially the lipid bilayer that they are talking about and you are assembling a self. So, so, you are actually putting this protein alpha amylysine on such a lipid bilayer and you assume that it is self assembles. So, there is a tendency of this protein to kind of go and embed into the lipid bilayer and kind of self assemble itself. What is very also very interesting and important here is that if you look at the alpha hemolysine as a protein molecule it really has a pore within it you know it has a small narrow channel and uh, this also acts as a biological protein based pore. Uh, there are a lot of uh, charge transfer processes across particularly our central neuro, uh, neural system nervous system where we use uh, uh, this charge intake and the charge outside delivery in order to transmit between the cells. Okay. And uh, these are called exocytosis or endocytosis based processes where they are essentially uh, you know proteins on the cell wall which would open and close and give way to the charges. So, so the, the pore size illustrated here on this alpha hemolysine is about 2.6 nanometers okay. and uh, as I have indicated before one helical turn of a DNA is off about 2 to 3 nanometers in size and so it very well matches with the 2.6 nanometer pore size on the, uh, the alpha hemolysine protein. So, as a result of which if you are assembling this kind of a structure across a cis and a trans chamber just in the manner that you have done for a cell, but in, in this case you make one side rich in DNA concentration another side lean and uh, then apply an electric field you should see the similar kind of effect as a drop or a, or a you know a dip in the current versus T plot to detect a single molecule okay, a single DNA molecule if it passes by. So, uh, that is exactly what uh, this principle is here uh, the recording that was made using this kind of a technology showed uh, that you have these small small peaks uh, dips which are coming out just because of the blockage of ion current as the DNA goes and blocks uh, one of the pores. What is also very important for me to tell you here is that uh, you know this, uh, this really is a size effect. Okay, so, what is also very important for me to tell you here is that it is really a size effect that means um, if you have let us say a molecule poly A as opposed to poly C and C as uh, if you look into the molecular structure of C cytosine it is little bigger it has 2, 6 carbon, uh, 5 carbon rings essentially and adenine on the other hand is a smaller a little bit smaller molecule. But if you can see here the, the there is a really a marked difference in the current values in case of poly A the current is slightly higher uh, than in case of poly C which means that you know if the size is more let us say this DNA here which is moving through this porous membrane is as a more size it takes a while uh, for the DNA to come out. So, the average current which would be able to get generated in the case of a loosely fitted molecule is slightly higher in comparison to the current which you can generate by a kind of tightly fitted molecule in the pore. And also uh, what is more interesting is that it takes a little more uh, time for the DNA to pass through the spore once it is tightly fitted as opposed to the loosely fitted. Now, this uh, in a sense is kind of breakthrough. Okay. It gives us a feeling that someday maybe uh, with this kind of strategy uh, we could be able to sequence uh, the DNA 
in terms of what basis it has just based on the response of, uh, of the current with time and this is really one of the holy grails in the, um, in the industry how to electronically be able to sequence and there are in fact companies now uh, which are doing these uh, electronic based sequencing um, and at least uh, um, uh, there are a few products uh, which are tried to be made commercial uh, very soon about electronic sequencing. Uh, there are a lot of novel ideas and a lot of projects which are in this direction of how to quickly uh, electronically uh, detect the sequence um, and uh, people uh, dream uh, in, in the range of something like a nanosecond a base pair kind of readout uh, of uh, these kind of uh, uh, processes. Okay. So, so in, in this particular uh, work though that uh, both RNA and DNA were tried and uh, they were observed traversing uh, through the nano channel structure right and uh, that kind of gave a new direction to, to this whole area of manufacturing nano scale pores. So, uh, one problem though about this particular work is that lipid bilayer being a very fragile uh, kind of system which is uh, which can be affected by temperature, pH a lot of these parameters people started thinking of okay. Uh, can we really produce synthetic pores made up of materials which are maybe thin wafers or polymeric materials. So, there are a few groups in the world which have developed uh, some of the synthetic nanopores and uh, uh, one of the strategies that people have normally followed is uh, using a SOI a silicon on insulator wafer as I would be just illustrating in this particular example. So, here as you see there is a there is an oxide layer of about 400 amps tongs. Uh, there is a silicon layer on the top of it of about 2500 Armstrongs and this hole is assembled onto a handle layer which is a much thicker wafer a uh, couple of microns probably couple of hundred microns uh, and this uh, although it is not to scale. So, it is a 4 inch SOI wafer with this handle layer the thickness of the uh, handle layer is about 525 uh, micrometers the SOI is about 250 nanometers the buried oxide is about 400 nanometers. Okay. So, what you do essentially is that uh, you first grow a thermal oxide on the wafer surface here you can see on these two sides essentially you are growing the, uh, the thermal oxide is about 1000 Armstrongs about 10 nanometers thick okay. and uh, I am sorry 100 nanometers thick and uh, this you do on all sides of the wafer. So, therefore, both surfaces having essentially uh, this thermal oxide. So, once you grow the thermal oxide on the wafer surface. Uh, you open a net window uh, somewhere somewhere in one of the sides as you can see uh, in this particular illustration here. Uh, this H window has been opened in the oxide where you essentially make silicon as the uh, selective layer and uh, silicon dioxide as the etching layer you design the etchant in that kind of a manner and use photolithography process to carve a small window of a sacrificial resist and create a via through which you could actually etch away the oxide and create a, a mask a hard mask of the oxide on the surface of the silicon. Okay. Once that is done uh, you can etch through the handle layer uh, just as illustrated in this particular example using an anisotropic etch process. So, essentially it is at an angle of about 54.34 degrees. An isotropic etch um, as I will be talking about uh, in details later on is an etch system where you use either uh, some kind of an hydroxide to perform um, an electron exchange process uh, as uh, uh, the layer etches away. So, you are essentially converting silicon into the corresponding silicon hydroxide and dissolving it away into the solution. However, what is important for me to mention is that at certain planes at certain crystal planes on the silicon surface the electron release is essentially uh, limiting the rate of uh, formulation of hydroxide because uh, of the higher density of atoms there is a more binding of electrons and so at a plane which is uh, also called 111 along that direction uh, the etch step is the slowest. Eventually whenever you do uh, uh, this etching as an averaging effect uh, it kind of shapes in the shape of a 111 plane which is at an angle of about 54 point. 3 4 degrees uh, with respect to the vertical. 
So, that is how you get this this kind of a window here. Okay. So, you have to use an agent combination one which is selective to SiO2 and uh, one which is selective. So, so, it cannot etch this oxide once it hits the oxide however, it etches the silicon. So, it is etching silicon and HI uh, uh, selective to oxide and in the other system it is etching the silicon dioxide and selective to silicon. So, you have to follow process 2 first and then process 1. Uh, so, you can hit the right shape over this handle layer. Okay. So, the etch top uh, is the buried oxide layer in that particular case all right, as you are seeing here. So, then what you do is you actually take this upside down and on the, so now, now you have uh, an illustration here where uh, uh, you are talking about again doing a etch window from the top side. Okay. So, you are actually and I am not showing the bottom side here, the bottom side is actually shown here in this case. So, you take this particular top portion as you are illustrated by this circle and, uh, and then you are doing an etch from the top side. So, essentially this is that oxide 1000 Armstrong's layer which you had grown earlier on the top of this silicon layer which is 1400 uh, Armstrong's uh, essentially and uh, uh, here this is uh, thermal oxide. So, you can say that earlier the silicon was uh, 2500 Armstrong's, but because oxidation is a diffusion driven process the oxide layer formulated is about 1000 Armstrong's making the silicon the pure silicon uh, about 1400 Armstrong's or so. Okay. So, now what you do is essentially you open another etch window here as you are seeing in this portion and here essentially you are using again a photolithographic masking step and a, a resist which is selective to silicon, but can etch away oxide very easily. So, you can open a 230 to 240 nanometers etch window and then again perform another anisotropic etch there would be some undercut uh, in this case as well. So, that this whole area here can be removed from the 1400 Armstrong's silicon layer and uh, you can design the thickness here in a manner. So, because this is 1400 you have uh, through calculations you can show that the lower part here is only reduced to about 70 to 80 nanometers. It is a very small uh, part that kind of remains at the very end of this pit. So, you have a case where you have opened an etch window from the back side and then use the same process step to open an etch window from the front side as well and effectively you are just left with this 4000 Armstrong's oxide layer in between the one which you saw here in between. Okay. So, this is only about 400 nanometers thick and then you have the advantage of the luxury of having a 70 to 80 nanometer hole on one side. So, you can actually now um, use E beam lithography and uh, uh, now etch or uh, you know a hole which is about close to 30 to 40 nanometers in this particular region. You can also use the focused ion beam uh, for creating such a pore. So, you could actually design a system wherein you can actually open a 30 to 40 nanometer film a small hole in this particular region here. Okay. In this particular 70 to 80 nanometer region you can create a small hole which is about 30 to 40 nanometers. So, once this uh, is created you put an oxide layer around it. Okay. So, you again uh, kind of grow you, you first remove the buried oxide. So, this essentially is the buried oxide layer as you are seeing this you know this 400 Armstrong's layer here is the buried oxide. So, you removing the um, so the buried oxide almost in totality all right except uh, a portion which is about 30 to 40 nanometers and uh, then you essentially regrow the 100 nanometer thermal oxide in this particular region you are regrowing the oxide. So, from this step to this step after you have opened a small hole here through FIB about 70 to 80 nanometers you are essentially trying to remove this layer altogether and uh, also try to grow so that you can uh, shrink this pore from the general uh, you know about 70 to 80 nanometers all the way to about um, 30 to 40 nanometers. Okay. And uh, once this 30 to 40 nanometer is created by etching away this oxide from the bottom uh, you can actually um, kind of regrow the thermal oxide on the sides here. Okay. 
So, if you see here this blue layer in this particular region which I am now marking red is the regrown oxide. So, you have step 1 where you are removing a small H window on the back side, you are removing an H window and, and etching on the front side so that you are reduced with reduced to 70 to 80 nanometers pore. You cut using an EBV lithography uh, a kind of uh, uh, this this 230 to 400 uh, 240 nanometers uh, you know width here of this particular oxide uh, and then you with an FIB kind of try to drill away this area or alternately you can also remove the oxide altogether and grow uh, or regrow th about 100 nanometers of thermal oxide around this area so that you are left with about 30 to 40 nanometers okay uh, one interesting point here to be noted is that uh, uh, if you heat this region using a focus beam, let us say uh, you are using uh, an E beam, an electron beam to kind of heat this particular area, you see that this oxide kind of reflows and tries to have a self closing gap. So, this 32 nanometers, 30 to 40 nanometers can be reduced to about 3 to 5 nanometers as you can see here. Okay. So, you are regrowing the oxide and you are trying to flow it so that it kind of becomes self closing. This is illustrated here in the example. Uh, if you can see uh, from this particular work uh, by uh, reported by Decker et al and you know later on Bashir et al. Um, what they are showing here is that this is an excellent visualization process. So, you take a TM and try to start visualizing the pore uh, when it is about 300,000 x. Uh, you can see this 41 into 26 nanometer pore and then uh, mind you the magnification here is about a 1000,000 x which is about uh, about 3 times this particular value and here you are trying to investigate a 23 nanometer pore and then if you look at the pore uh, with time as you are focusing the electron beam the oxide reflows and the pore kind of starts becoming uh, smaller and smaller. So, it starts self closing till it attains about 4.2 nanometers times 4.6 nanometers and you essentially stop the visualization process in this particular instance. So, you are taking the bigger hole here which is regrown with an oxide on the surface and trying to focus the E beam and causing self heating. So, that there is a flow of this oxide and self closure of the pore. You could see the smallest pore size here which is about uh, 4.2 nanometers times 4.6 nanometers and this is how size of a DNA would be or it rhymes very well with the size of a DNA. So, you can make a synthetic nanopore uh, in this manner uh, which you could later on use for DNA translation um, and also try to understand or gauge uh, whether it can do some sequencing. Okay. So, this is how these nanopore channel sensors are characterized uh, especially particularly for double stranded DNA structure. So, you can see that there is a micron size pore uh, or there is a nanometer size pore here which is uh, you know in length about 50 to 60 nanometers and in, in diameter is about close to 4 to 5 nanometers and the DNA kind of uh, is translated from the cis side to the trans side. And uh, so, essentially uh, you can think of uh, this side to be the positive bias here, this side to be the negative bias here and the DNA translating across the spore. What is very interesting to note here is that you get upward peaks like this. Okay. So, the peaks here essentially are in the reverse direction, uh, they are as if there is a large ion current suddenly being released uh, after the DNA blocks and is about to cross over. So, uh, this, this paper reported by Bashir et al which I just illustrated earlier uh, here uh, in this particular example. It tries to kind of explore in this principle that why is it that we are getting a peaking action rather than uh, you know a dip in the current level. And so, one explanation which is possible is uh, given by this uh, tendency of the DNA to kind of carry uh, a counter ion cloud around it. You know we have been discussing off and on in the earlier lectures the DNA is essentially having a very strong charge on the backbone a negative charge on the backbone. So, if it flows in a solution and it is essentially electrophoresing in a solution, there is a tendency of this DNA to grab together uh, a, a counter ion cloud around it and uh, this shields uh, the overall charge as we have uh, modeled before in electrophoresis it uh, uh, kind of leads to a reduction in the charge by delta z and also increase in the radius the overall radius 
because it is moving along with the whole ion cloud in the center. Now, uh, the idea here is that as the DNA travels into this region and it kind of grabs together uh, this ion current along with it and as it goes out into the other region, uh, it not only kind of uh, introduces or it not only kind of uh, uh, introduces a negative charge in this region, but also the positive counter ion group which it is carrying along with it. That is the reason for sudden spurt of increase in the in the charge in the ion pore. So, you can think of it that uh, as uh, this is a positive ion it kind of drags along the positive ion and it, it leaves into this side of the solution and the positive ion starts coming back once it crosses through the pore okay, and it comes back in this direction as the DNA is moving in this direction and uh, these whole positive ions here which come back or are pumped back into the, uh, the cis side okay, from where the DNA has translated into the trans side essentially. Uh, because of this there is a huge increase in current rather than reduction in current. So, this essentially is, is an opposite effect than the micro scale counter counter in which you have no such uh, effect because you know you are talking about a micron scale object. Uh, whatever the flow is across that micron scale gap is a bulk flow, but here because we talk about more in terms of uh, almost uh, to a single ion level what is going on this counter ion effect very it becomes very very important. Okay. So, you can think of that this counter ion cloud which is going with the DNA into the pore when the DNA escapes it is kind of released back into the solution in the reverse side as a result of which there is an increase or a peaking effect rather than uh, a dip down as is normally observed in other cases. Okay. This is more so also because the silicon surface here essentially uh, develops a charged dual layer um, you know because uh, you are talking about the same range as that of the dual layer uh, between the silicon and uh, you know the translating molecule. So, uh, if this process is a lot more complicated than the normal micro scale Coulter counter. So, essentially you can conclude by saying that in this case the DNA induces extra potassium ions when passing through the nano channels. Uh, the interface current of uh, the potassium ions does increase suddenly and at the same time bulk currents decrease because the because of the DNA blocking. Okay. So, the overall effect is an increase in the current uh, because of a sudden spurt of release of these ions back into the solution. So, particularly in this uh, example a 200 base pair DNA has been used with a concentration of about 0 0.3 milligram per mil and uh, the electrodes used for this measurement are this AG, AG Cl based electrodes. As you know this uh, AG Cl itself is non dissolvable in uh, an aqueous uh, solution. So, you have a coating of AgCl on the top of Ag uh, that is the way you use uh, these kind of electrodes. We have talked in details in the electrochemistry section of this course. The bias voltage used in this case is about 200 millivolts and the time of sampling is about 100 microseconds which you would also get using a high resolution DAC card a data acquisition card. Okay. So, this in a sense is a is actually it has become a very major uh, research area nowadays in biomems as to how you could actually uh, measure uh, the single molecular translation across these uh, nanopores and is it of some utility or effect in the diagnostics area. So, uh, there are other forms of sensing or detection um, uh, which uh, can be used with uh, these MEMS kind of architectures and uh, so we, would have, we had been talking earlier about silicon micro devices. So, this is a direct application of uh, a silicon micro device in biosensing and uh, this talks about mechanical uh, detection or a mass based detection which was uh, kind of one of the frontier areas of uh, sensing uh, these days. Okay. So, here um, what um, uh, this, this process is all about is defined by uh, change in surface stress across a small thin film micro cantilever. So, you can see here this is a micro cantilever which is coming uh, all the way into the small pool okay, and uh, it is separated from the base. Okay. So, it is like a it is like a cantilever which is uh, pointed into uh, a gap here like a swimming pool. So, it is a diving board and a swimming pool kind of arrangement and uh, here um, if you do something in the surface of this cantilever in a manner that the surface energy uh, has a differential on the top and the bottom surface. You, you put some molecules 
uh, you change the surface energy somehow by binding it to uh, let us say some hydroxyl groups or some other SAMS layer self assembled monolayer in a manner that there is a differential between the bottom surface of the cantilever and the top surface of the cantilever okay in this manner. So, you have uh, something immobilized onto this region here on the top so that you have a difference between the bottom and the top surfaces of the cantilever okay. So, there is a bending because of this there is a mechanical bending and this bending is also defined by something called the Stoney's equation as given uh, in this particular illustration here. So, the bending delta z in this case and delta z is this particular distance that the cantilever moves is also directly proportional to a difference in the surface energies on the top and the bottom surface of the cantilever. So, delta sigma 1 and delta sigma 2 here are the difference in surface energies on the top and bottom surface which occur because of this chemical change or chemical activation of the surface right. And so, therefore, delta z here uh, the change in the uh, z motion of the particular cantilever is also directly proportional to the difference delta sigma 1 minus delta sigma 2 ok. So, delta d delta z again is the deflection of the free end of the cantilever l is the overall length of the cantilever t is the thickness is the Young's modulus and u is the Poisson's ratio and uh, delta sigma 1 and 2 are change in surface stresses on the top and bottom surface. So, this essentially is a mechanism of uh, detecting if really there is a change you can produce a yes no type of answer of whether there is a surface change and I will just in a minute uh, show another slide which talks about how you could detect uh, DNA or recognize DNA of different uh, base pairs okay, based on this technique uh, by just immobilizing some capture probes on the top of uh, such cantilevers such micro cantilevers. And really these cantilevers could be of all different kind of shapes this for instance is more like a V shaped cantilever as you can see you know uh, this is actually a straight uh, I shaped cantilever. Uh, so, some typical dimensions of these cantilevers are illustrated here it is about, about 200 nanometers thick film over which you make these cantilevers and they can project as long as about 100 microns ok. So, it is really a very it has to be a sturdy film a sturdy structure which can go up to 100 microns and still be integral although uh, uh, the thickness is only as low as about 200 nanometers. So, this is what the aspect ratio is about 5 times ok. And uh, they are normally made in silicon because uh, the process is very well uh, acknowledged and found out. However, there are initiatives to also make cantilevers in uh, other alternate polymeric material with certain changes in their strength properties or modification in the strength properties. So, let us see what we can do with this uh, and this is really an example a very fine example uh, bought from uh, you know IBM's uh, uh, research plan on biosensing. So, this is uh, also uh, corresponding to a paper reported by Fritz et al in science which talks about uh, how uh, such uh, instruments or techniques can be used for bio detection. Okay, so, here in this illustration as you see there are two different kind of capture probes which are put on both sides of uh, on, on a series of two cantilevers. So, there is cantilever 1 and cantilever 2 here on which there are these blue probes which are fitted uh, on one side and red probes which are fitted on another side. So, there are two different capture sequences altogether, right and uh, what we do is that in the first instance uh, there is a uh, there is a green target here you can see this green target which is corresponding uh, or is just complementary to the red target which was already immobilized onto this particular layer of the cantilever ok. So, and, and this cantilever is also coated with the piezo material. So, you have uh, uh, a kind of transduction of uh, electrical into me uh, mechanical into electrical uh, signal uh, across this surface of the cantilever. So, now when you flow this uh, green probe which is only specifically able to bind to the red probe leaving the blue probe there is always a surface reaction at this cantilever end here ok as you are seeing the DNA is binding here the red probe uh, which was there on the cantilever is binding to the green target which is flowing by whereas in the other cantilever here there is no binding there is no significant binding because this blue probe here does not really bind it is not complementary with the green probe. So, what would happen is that there is a change in, in the signal generated and if uh, this were to be the reference signal and there was a reference 0 in this area there would certainly be differential which is being introduced here. So, this is the differential signal that is reported with the time in minutes as the binding takes place. So, as you see here the binding is kind of ensuring that uh, there is a pickup in the differential signal and then there is a continuity here 
until now uh, what we do is we flow another probe of similar nature, but now this time this is complementary to the blue probe here. Okay. So, there is another another target which we are flowing here which is complementary and it has the same number of base pairs uh, on both the size cases to the blue probe here. So, now the blue binds to this yellow target and the yellow does not bind to all of these bound DNA only and therefore, this thing also bends this cantilever now also bends. So, this corresponds to a change back of the signal all up to 0. So, the differential signal which arose here uh, because of uh, a binding of the green target with the red probe kind of changes back to 0 because of the binding of the yellow target with the blue probe. Okay. So, this is how uh, you could really uh, make DNA fast DNA detection possible uh, by looking at just bending uh, uh, mechanisms associated with a pair of different cantilevers. Okay. Uh, this is an illustration of how these cantilevers would typically look like you have all different shapes and sizes for these cantilevers as you can see here and this was actually reported uh, as a module by IBM and its uh, Zurich research center for the first time where they talked about how DNA hybridization can be carried out using mechanical signals. So, this was kind of one of the first initiatives in the area of how sensing can be in terms of transduction into mechanical signals from chemical signals. Okay. So, this in, in a sense is some of the uh, kind of range of work that uh, has been covered uh, in the area of DNA related uh, detection and sensing using bio MEMS kind of architectures. All right. okay, so, this kind of brings us uh, to the end of this uh, particular uh, lecture. Uh, so, in the next uh, illustration the next uh, lecture we would cover uh, topics or different topics or aspects related to proteins and then we will look at how uh, the, the living cell normally correlates between the sequences of the RNA and uh, the proteins and we will find out more that is in fact a very interesting topic of uh, the process called transcription and translation within a, um, a cell. Okay. Uh, thank you.